Welcome everyone, thanks for joining. I wanna do something a little bit different in this video. Normally we go over news and current events and a lot of the buzz of what's going on. In this video, I wanna change gears and focus on something different, which is my portfolio and the underlying concepts of what I'm trying to accomplish here. The portfolio has reached a value of nearly $300,000, and that's typically the focus for people, is building up the total value of their portfolio through any means necessary. What I like to focus on more though, is the concept of passive income. The way that I define passive income is money that you earn on an incremental basis, like every month, every week, that you don't have to work for. So if you lost your job and you don't have any type of active income, you would still have your passive income providing you cash flow. That's what I consider to be passive income, money that you're earning without actively working for it. There's multiple ways to earn passive income, but there's very few good ways to earn it. A couple good ways are through real estate, private ownership of it, or through dividend stocks. Those are the two best ways that I know of how to earn passive income. There's different strategies with bonds and uh, different things that you can do that might be considered passive income but those mostly don't pay as well. I don't think there's good of options. So the two primary ways that I know of how to earn passive income is through private real estate ownership and through dividend paying stocks. In this video, because I've chosen to make stocks my primary strategy, we're gonna be going over that category. We're gonna be going over how I plan on increasing my passive income through the ownership of high cash flow stocks that pay dividends. Now, the first thing I wanna do is go ahead and address some of the criticism that people give towards passive income, the whole concept of it. There's articles like this that say the passive income myth. They say, let's debunk passive income myth outright. Truly passive income doesn't exist. Passive income is a term that is loosely thrown around to define a revenue stream that takes little to no effort to manage. So I'm saying that it does exist. I'm saying that dividend stocks are definitely a form of passive income. This individual is arguing that they're not and that passive income does not exist. They say further down in this article, in fact, there is nothing passive about any passive business. Investors who earn passive money from interest and dividends must stay on top of their investments lest they suffer losses. All right, so the argument here is that because I have to manage a portfolio, this is not passive income. I agree that you might have to do some active management, but not really. The money that I receive in dividends from these companies is with extraordinarily low amounts of work. I don't do a lot to manage this portfolio. I simply look at what companies are doing well, which ones are suffering. I sell the ones that are suffering and I buy more of the ones that are doing well. There's not a lot of effort behind that. And if I wanted to narrow this down to completely zero effort, I would just buy ETFs like Jeppy and SCHD that gather together a lot of dividend paying stocks into one fund, and then they pay that out every single quarter. So this is 100% passive income. When I go and I look at my dividend history, here is what it looks like this month. I have Nike that paid me $9, Jeppy that paid me $83, we have T. Rowe Price that paid me $30, Vici that paid me $77, MGM Growth Properties that paid me $21, Realty Income Corp that paid me $15, and Store Capital that paid me $136. This month in my portfolio, I've earned hundreds of dollars in dividends passively. I haven't had to work for any of these. I didn't go to Nike and clock in and say, hey, I need to contribute to the company Nike to help them sell their shoes but yet they paid me passive income. The JP Morgan Equity Premium ETF that paid me $83, they're managing that themselves. I have two experts at JP Morgan that manage this ETF for me. At T. Rowe Price, I haven't looked at this company in the past three years. I haven't looked at it one time and it's paid me consistent dividends every single quarter. We have Vici, MGM Growth Properties, Realty Income, Store Capital. All these companies are paying me dividends. I'm not clocking in at these companies. I'm not doing any work. I'm just in the ownership roles where they manage their business, but I collect the check. So that's the first thing I wanna address. I believe that there really is forms of passive income, and I believe that dividend paying stocks in and of themselves are the most passive form of income that possibly exists. And these arguments that because you have to log into your M1 Finance account and look at a few companies once a quarter, once every 90 days you have to check in on your investments, that it makes it not passive income, I think is a little bit grasping at straws. Come on now, that's not a lot of work to log in once in a while and see how your companies are doing. And if you really believe that that's a lot of effort and it doesn't make it passive income, then just buy an ETF. 
That's an easy solution to it. Then you're literally doing nothing to earn that income. If you're still debating in your mind whether or not passive income is real or attainable, let me just tell you that it is. That's the answer. It is real. It is attainable. If you make effort to generate a stream of passive income starting now and you make smart investment decisions throughout your life, you can generate a sizable amount of passive income through dividend investing. And there's people that I talk to every single day on the Discord that are literally living off of passive income through dividends right now. Here's a screenshot of the brokerage of one of those individuals. He has a revenue stream of $60,000 in passive income. He will tell you how much work it is to manage this portfolio. He's in retirement and spoiler alert, it's not a lot of work. He's earning most of this money without any effort whatsoever. Now I can do the same thing with my portfolio. I can project into the future how much money I'm going to earn through a piece of software that we built out in-house as part of the Patreon. So if you join the Patreon, you'll have access to Qualtrum.com. That is our dividend tracking and projection website. And we also have an iOS app for this as well. So we're going to be coming out with Android soon. But this piece of software... I think is very motivational because it shows you how much money you're going to be earning in the future based off of your current holdings and how much they paid last year in dividends. It projects the next 12 months of dividends. So next month in August, I'm projected to earn $601 in dividends. And then in September, I'm projected to earn $528 in dividends. In October, I'm projected to earn $797 in dividends. On average, if I look at the annual projection, That is $6,879. And this is a conservative estimate because it's based on last year's payment and most of these companies will raise dividends over time. So this is actually a conservative estimate. As I reinvest dividends, as I build up my portfolio, this number will grow. And then I think even better is looking at this on a monthly basis. On a monthly basis, my average monthly income is $573. I think that's pretty substantial. When I look at that, I'm pretty proud of that number, but I want to continue to grow it to $1,000 a monthly income like many of the people on the Patreon already. There's a lot of people that I talk with on a daily basis that are earning far more than this monthly in passive income. I think that the big reason why so many people struggle financially, they struggle building up assets, they don't even believe in it after a while. They don't even believe in the, the possibility of passive income is because of a misunderstanding of how their cash should be flowing. Robert Kiyosaki, I think, nails this concept. He says, the rich do not work for money. They make their money work for them. That's a little bit of a cliche phrase, making your money work for you. But he says even more distinctly that the rich do not work for money. They work for assets. And I think that that's spot on. If you look at examples of wealthy people and what they work for, Mark Zuckerberg's salary is $1. That's how much his salary is. Is he working for money? No, he's not working for money. Jeff Bezos' salary, get this, his salary is $81,840. That's his salary, $81,000. I made more money than Jeff Bezos working as a programmer. That's what his salary was. But he's worth currently $205.6 billion. So do you think Jeff Bezos was working for money or was he working for assets? He was clearly working for assets. He could not care any less about his salary. He could not possibly care less about it. Warren Buffett's salary is $100,000. That's his total salary. He pays employees in his companies much more than he does because Warren Buffett doesn't care about working for money. In dividends last year, just one of his holdings, just Coca-Cola paid $1.68 billion, but yet his salary, his compensation is $100,000. Rich people do not work for money. They work for assets. Another way of phrasing this, another way of rephrasing this statement is... You're not likely to become rich working for money. You're far more likely to become rich working for assets. Unless you do something like become an NBA player or a movie actor and your salary is $20 million, you're not likely to become rich working for money. It just doesn't work that way. Look at examples of any wealthy person. All of them have assets. They have ownership. They have equity. That's how people gain wealth in today's world. And it's been that way for a very long time. So you shouldn't look at your cash flow that you get from your job and your income as money. You should look at it as an avenue to put that immediately into as many assets as possible that put money back into your pocket every single month. So when I look at my portfolio, I don't view this as some side thing that I'm, you know, I do with my leftover money from my income. I view it as the primary place for the majority of my income to go, especially my discretionary income. So everything beyond 
The requirements to pay your mortgage, to pay your rent, to buy groceries. I try to put as much as I can into my passive income account. I try to fund this as aggressively as possible because I want to view my work on YouTube, programming, whatever I'm doing as a means to an end. It's a way to earn money so that I can put that money immediately into assets. So really what I'm working for is assets. I'm not working for money. And those assets do produce cash that gets reinvested over and over again. All this portfolio is on M1 Finance is a tool to help me accomplish the goal of passive income. All of it leads back to this. All these companies that I'm invested in, in these various investments, they're all just little tools in this toolbox helping me to accomplish the goal of generating reliable and growing streams of income. That's what all of this leads back to. Now, when we get into selecting stocks, there's a couple things that I look for, and I wanna go to Bill Ackman to highlight some of the characteristics that I look at. Bill Ackman is a legendary hedge fund manager. He's performed very well. He's beat the market for a long time, and he focuses on one key thing. The big thing that he's focused on when he's asked about his investment philosophy is cash flow. That's the big thing that he focuses on is again, this concept of cash flow. Uh, so we look for very high quality businesses. That's the first thing that he outlines. He looks for high quality businesses. So he's not a bargain hunter for the most cheap business that exists. He looks for quality. And that's something that I also agree with Bill Ackman on. The first thing that I look for typically with a company is the qualities of it. I do not want to buy low quality companies. Uh, what we describe as simple, predictable, free cash flow generative. He next outlines simple, predictable, free cash flow generative businesses. Simple and predictable, free cash flow generative. Dominant businesses, a, a business that Warren Buffett would describe as having a moat around it, right? He also talks about dominant businesses, businesses that have a moat around it, meaning they're unlikely to be disrupted by competition. But even after all these different characteristics from high quality, free cash flow generative, dominant businesses, having a moat around it, he goes back to cash flow as the primary thing that he looks at. And he highlights the importance of cash flow. If you believe that the value of anything financial is the present value of the cash you can take out of it over its life, well, you need to know what, how much cash is going to generate over its life. So, the, so business quality to us is the single most important uh, criterion for determining what's interesting. Because if, if we can't predict the cash flows, we don't know what it's worth. If we don't know what it's worth, we can't invest. Everything for him and his investments comes back to cash flow. He wants high quality companies that are unlikely to be disruptive, that have very reliable and predictable cash flows, that they can give that profit back to their shareholders. Those are the type of investments that he looks for. Now, I personally believe that dividend investing in particular is an easy way to accomplish this strategy without having to be a legendary investor like Bill Ackman. You don't have to have a team of analysts. You don't have to have a bunch of mathematicians or algorithms to be able to find good dividend paying companies that meet those characteristics of being high quality, of having easily predictable future cash flows, of being difficult to, to compete with, you know, having good moats. These aren't difficult to find. There's lots of good businesses out there that pay dividends that meet all of these characteristics. I wanna go over the three major ways that you compound your wealth by buying dividend paying companies. And again, this all comes back to cash flow. The first way is the most simple, the most easy to understand, but I think it's also the most difficult. When you buy a dividend stock, you're buying future cash flows. We all know that if you go and you purchase a company like Store Capital, this is a real estate company, it has a 4% yield. So you buy this company and you'll get paid 4% per year of your initial purchase price. That's how much you're getting every single year. So you're literally buying future cash flow with this money. The reason that this is difficult is because you have to work at this part. You have to work for the money to be able to purchase this asset. And that is the most difficult aspect of investing. The second way that dividend companies help compound your future cash flows is through reinvestment. The cash flow from dividends is reinvested, increasing your cash flow further. So not only do you have your deposits that you have to actively work for, but now you have your companies working for you. You're making your money work for you. That's what wealthy people do. You can see the obvious examples of this. So far in my portfolio, the earned dividends is past $8,000. All of that money that I've earned in dividends has been reinvested back into the portfolio. It first ends up in the cash balance, then I reinvest it back into other dividend paying stocks. So this $8,000 that's paid to me in dividends is now $8,000 worth of stocks paying me more in dividends. So my future cash flow is compounded. And the third way that you increase your cash flow over time with dividends is dividends are not bonds. Bonds will pay you the same amount every single year, year after year, 
companies raise their dividends over time as they increase their earnings. So if a company earns more money over time, the amount that it will pay you in dividends likely goes up over time as well. On average, dividend companies raise their dividends around 6 or 7% per year. Some raise them more, some raise them less, but almost every company has the goal of raising their dividend over time. We can look again at the example of Store Capital to see how companies like this raise their dividend over time. The first dividend that Store Capital paid was way back in 2015. They had an 11 cent dividend. That was the very first one, 11 cents per share. They immediately raised that the next quarter over double to 25 cents. And then they kept it at 25 cents for only two quarters. And then they raised it again to 27 cents. So shareholders that bought it right here, paying an 11 cent dividend, within one year, they were paying 27 cents per share, over doubling the amount of income that they're getting paid without doing anything. They just owned the very same shares they started with. And then they went on, they raised it again in 2017, in 2018, in 2019, in 2020, and even in 2021, with COVID, with all the stuff that happened that harmed their business, this company was still able to safely raise their dividend. And they are currently paying a dividend of 36 cents over three times what they started in 2015. I think it's understated how much dividend paying companies raise their dividends. They raise their dividends like six or 7% on average per year. And they've been doing that for decades. Can you imagine working a job where you got a consistent six or 7% raise per year every single year without fail? You'd be making a fortune after 20 years. That usually does not happen. You can get raises sometimes if you really hassle your boss or if you leave companies to a different job, but this type of increase in income is very unlikely. Realty Income Corp since 2015 increased the amount of income they're paying their shareholders by 3x over three times. Did you get a three times wage growth in your job over the past five years? Maybe some of you did if you got a brand new position or if you just finished schooling, but other than those unique instances, most of us are not growing our wages by three times over the past five years. But you can do that with dividend paying stocks. There's many of them that have incredible growth with the amount of money they're paying their shareholders. And luckily, we don't have to have that massive amount of wage growth. We can buy into these companies on the market and allow us to share in the ownership and reap the rewards of these dividend raises. So we have all of these factors working together in harmony and they're self-reinforcing. Every one of these reinforces each other to ultimately increase your future cash flow. That again is the entire goal is to generate future cash flows. Number one, when you buy a dividend stock, you're literally buying future cash flows. That's ultimately what you're purchasing. You're not purchasing Home Depot. You're not purchasing store capital. You're purchasing future cash flows. You're purchasing a productive asset that has a reliable future cash flow stream. Number two, the cash flow from dividends is reinvested further increasing your future cash flow. This is basic reinvestment. When I buy companies like Store Capital and I start off with my $1 dividend and $2 and then $7 and it grows to $12 and $37 and $57 and $159, I'm not taking this money out and spending it. I'm reinvesting it back into other productive cash flow paying companies. So this again gets compounded. And then we have number three, one that I think is often overlooked, which is that companies that pay dividends like to raise their dividends as they increase their earnings and their cash flows. So again, all of these go back to future cash flows. They work in harmony. They're self-reinforcing. And this is the type of thing that makes people extraordinarily wealthy over long periods of time. Warren Buffett is obviously the go-to example of someone that understood the concept of compounding very early on in his life, and he's used that advantage to compound his wealth to massive amounts over his lifetime. He did this not by investing in extremely complex technology companies. He invested in very basic known brands, companies that had significant amounts of free cash flow. Everyone wants to hear what Warren Buffett has to say. The Oracle of Omaha, building his image and having some fun. Berkshire shares have increased more than 2,000% in value. One of the largest market capitalizations in the world. And it could grow a lot larger since Warren Buffett shows no sign of slowing down. So how did he do it? By investing in what he knows and understands. Good old-fashioned American brands like Coca-Cola, Fruit of the Loom, and Dairy Queen. Coca-Cola, Fruit of the Loom, and Dairy Queen. This is how Buffett made his fortunes. He's the best investor in the world. He's compounded his gains for decades at a time, and he's done so investing in very basic brands. 
That is really good. Who's got the most $100 bills these days? Well, his name is Warren Buffett in this country, and he has just displaced his friend Bill Gates as the richest businessman in the world. He was establishing a reputation that paid off later in life. It's been building and building ever since I've known him. Now, I'm not suggesting that we're going to end up as wealthy as Warren Buffett. I don't think that that's likely to happen, but I am suggesting that the principle of compounding, it works whether you have a very large portfolio or a much smaller one. I have a much smaller portfolio than Warren Buffett, but the principle of compounding works the same. I'm increasing the amount of money I'm earning in dividends dramatically. I've earned $8,200 so far in total, but just in the past 30 days, I've earned $605. So it's going up at a decent pace as I aggressively fund this portfolio. Another thing I wanna highlight again is that this is not rocket science. You don't have to pay for expensive courses. You don't have to go to some amazing school to be able to learn how to invest like this. Warren Buffett's portfolio right now is mostly Apple, a pretty well-known stock. I think it's a great company. Then he has Bank of America, American Express, Coca-Cola, Moody's Corporation, and so on and so forth. These are very recognizable, simple companies with predictable cash flows. This is the type of investing he's done to have such good performance and compounding over so many years. So when you're doing this type of investing, it's not so important that you find obscure, unique companies that nobody else has heard about that have some you know, different, unique type of technology. That's not what we're looking for here. You're looking for basic companies that have predictable cash flows. These type of companies tend to perform really well. Look at the performance of Costco against the S&P 500 since 1995. Costco has crushed the general market. If you look at the performance with dividends reinvested, it's returned like five times the amount of money over that time period. Completely crushed the market. And this is Costco, a warehouse company. And we can even compare this against the tech-heavy QQQ the NASDAQ 100, all those fancy technology companies, Costco still crushes it in returns with much lower volatility. So companies like Costco that are very plain, very known, in many cases make some of the best investments. So I continue to focus on basic companies like Costco. My most recent purchases are high free cash flow businesses like Vici Properties, a real estate company that owns a lot of places in Vegas, as well as MGM Growth Properties, which is another real estate owner of a lot of the MGM properties. So these ones have increased my cash flow a lot, and I'm going to be looking for other opportunities to expand this. So that's the update for now. I hope you enjoyed my thoughts on this subject. I thought it would be good to do a little bit of a, a divergence from the normal news and buzz that you get and focus on what the underlying aspects of wealth generation is. And I think a lot of it is putting the money that you earn back into cash producing assets and rinsing and repeating over and over again. I really believe that that's a big key to growing well. So that's my thoughts on the subject. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, it always helps out to like the video, subscribe to the channel, um, that's free to do. If you wanna join the Patreon and help support the creation of more content, you can do so by clicking on the link in the description. It brings you to the Patreon and included in that Patreon is Qualtrum and the iOS app. So normally that's $10 a month for just Qualtrum. That is included with the Patreon along with the exclusive episodes, the Discord community, and everything else. So you can check that out if you're interested as well. Other than that, I'll see you next time.